and all that sort of thing. Uh, so we don't have to take a break here. So the panelists on this next panel, come on up here. And while you're walking up there, perhaps I will uh, introduce the moderator, Dr. Leslie Lyons. So for those of you who were not here yesterday, <laughs> for those of you who were not here yesterday, uh, and many of the people watching from all over, in fact, you might not have been here yesterday. So, uh, and this will give us an opportunity to mic people up. Dr. Lyons is a Gilbreth McLaurin Endowed Professor of Comparative Medicine at the Department of Veterinary Medicine and Surgery at the College of Veterinary Medicine, University of Missouri. Dr. Lyons was educated in human genetics at the University of Pittsburgh and her postdoctoral research at the National Cancer Institute developed genetic resources for comparative gene mapping across various mammalian species. Dr. Lyons has several patients, I mean, I didn't mean to say that, several patents and over close, and over 130 peer reviewed publications. She should be tired. And overall, the goal of her research is to bring precision medicine to domestic cats and other companion animals. Her genetic study on cat population dynamics and domestication was produced as a National Geographic Explorer episode called, and I saw it, The Science of Cats. And she has worked with BBC and several other cat productions, and I've even interviewed her on the radio. Here is Dr. Leslie Lyons. <laughs> All right, good morning, good morning. We had a very exciting day uh, yesterday, so let's hope uh, we keep it rolling today and get a little excitement with our with our discussions today. The first round table is gonna be, my cat has FIP, now what the heck do I do, all right? So what are our options right now and our um, what are our hopes? And so this board here is going to help us answer some of your questions and we'll throw out uh, questions as well and I have a few that have uh, been written down for me as well. So again, uh, remind you detailed um, information about each one of the uh, um, panelists is in the back of your, uh, your guide here. But I would like to start right down the row and have you uh, each introduce yourself and uh, end with you, troublemaker. And, uh... <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Dr. Glenn Ola. I'm a feline specialist. I live in Albuquerque. I practice at a feline-only clinic, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, my name is Peter Cohen. I'm one of the co-founders of Zen by Cat. Um, I'm just a crazy cat guy who has a lot of cats. Susan Gingrich, um, you know who I am, but you might not know that I'm a medical practitioner. That's my background. And um, I'm also, a, besides other things, a research junkie, human and feline. Hi, I'm Deb Roberts. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. Um, my background's in nursing. And I'm the owner of Luna, who was um, the first cat in uh, Dr. Peterson's second um, FIP trial. And I'm here super excited to be here and share her story and how this all came to be. I'm Dave Brett. I'm a veterinary internist and currently uh, chief medical officer at Anvi. Uh, Niels Peterson. Uh, I'm now a distinguished professor emeritus, uh, still active, uh, University of California at Davis in the School of Veterinary Medicine. I've been here, graduated here in 67. My first FIP research started in 1964. First paper was in 1967. I have about 40 or 50 publications uh, in peer review journals on, on FIP. Uh, and in spite of what Drew says, I will keep his feet to the fire. <laughs> we do know a lot more about this disease than he said that we did. Okay. Uh, uh, so I just want to say a couple of things. This young man right next to me was one of my outstanding residents. Uh, Leslie was uh, a it's dear trouble. friend that uh, <laughs> I worked hard to bring to uh, to the University of California and cried among a lot of others when she left for Missouri, but uh, she's done well. And to all of you that I've met during the course of, uh, every one of you I've met during uh, personal interactions of a whole number of kinds. Uh, and I look forward to this uh, uh, 
discussion. And I hope we can come up with some really good uh, points uh, that indicate the future. Uh, everybody thinks we have, because we have a cure, that's it. Uh, we don't need anything else. But, and there, are, if you can believe some of the figures out there, there are probably as many as five or 6,000 cats that are under treatment at this time or in some stage or a finished treatment. That's worldwide, so that's and that's moved really, uh, really fast. Those cases aren't going to be cleared. In other words, when they're all cured, there's going to be another five thousand coming on, or ten thousand. They're going to keep on coming, and they're going to keep on coming because we're seeing a very high incidence of the disease. And when I say high, maybe I mean one percent or so, but one out of a hundred is a lot. Of consider uh, how many cats, uh, you know, when you consider cats worldwide, uh, we're seeing an increased incidence in environments that are now a major source of our kittens for, uh, for pets. Let's, let's make that clear. So we're talking about rescues, we're talking about shelters, we're talking about catteries. That's where our kittens are coming from. Uh, and this, this, these are the, this is the high risk environment. And so we still don't know, but we, we have an idea that these environments are somehow contributing to increasing the incidence of disease. But, and we could talk about stress, we can talk about space, we can talk about immunity, we can talk about vaccination, uh, worming drugs, uh, flea medicate, all sorts of things, you know, as cofactors in this disease. But the point is we really don't know what those cofactors are. And just think if we could prevent <laughs> these cases, how much better that is than curing these cases. Okay, so we still have a lot to do, a really lot to do. And my hope is that just because we have a cure out there, the interest in supporting FIP research and to have people at the proper institutions that do research still be able to require to obtain the funds that will allow them to do this research, you know, that that money will be, uh, will be forthcoming. So I, I hope what we come up with this morning is as much information as possible as what we think are these cofactors might be and throw it all out as silly as they may seem. I mean, just throw anything out there and we will discuss them uh, and hopefully ideas that come out of this session will then be used as uh, uh, formats for actual uh, actual studies and research studies in the future. So that, that's all I have to say. We still have a lot to do. All right. Well, um, yesterday, one of my questions was, um, what is the earliest signs people notice that they think their, their cat has FIP? And so that becomes one of my first questions today. We know there's a drug it's being used. How effective is it? What is the timing that you need to get that drug to start the cat onto the drug? What is the hope if, you know, if, if the cat is just, uh, what was it, not looking right or not feeling right? Yeah. Uh, versus, you know, now we already have um, fluid in the stomach. So that's, that's my first question for the panel. What is the hope of this drug as far as where the cat is in the course of its disease. Who has experience and, yep, yeah, okay. Uh, my personal cat was um, neurological and he'd actually been sick for- Hold it, hold it, hold it. I need to give you a microphone. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Here you go. Thank you. Um, yeah, my cat Oswald was um, neurological. He started off with weak back legs. It's actually how I saw it. He was always failure to thrive. Kind of knew something was wrong with him. Um, he was actually, his ears were yellow. He actually had eye issues. And he was within, I would say, 48 hours of death when we actually started the medicine that we started. And within a day, his fever broke. Within a week, all of his neurological symptoms were gone. And now he's 11 weeks, one day post treatment. So he was really far gone. So, oh, I got the medicine within 24 hours. So, and it, He's doing great. He's now up to 10 pounds. Oh, okay. yeah. oh yeah. She had wet. So my cat won't be who you just saw on the survivors. Um, 
he had wet FIP. Uh, vet was actually uh, very helpful of giving me the information where to find the drugs. Um, so um, she, she said, I can't mention this, but the papers are right there on the corner of my desk. So it's up to you if you want to research that or not. And uh, please let me know what you do. So uh, on the way home, my son started looking on the internet uh, of what she provided. And I found uh, what we were starting to use. Uh, next day, um, we had the medicine. She gave him two more days if we didn't do a, a blood transfusion because he was severe anemic. But within 24 hours, uh, his fever broke. Um, on day six, all the fluids were gone. And uh, at day 30, all his blood work uh, looked within range and it just kept improving until 12. Now, tomorrow, he's 12 weeks past treatment and officially cured. Okay. Well, I get there. You can ask okay. another question. While I, while I get there, my first thought becomes, what happens if you give this drug to a cat that actually doesn't have FIP? Does it hurt? <laughs> Oh, did you want well, me? Let, me? let me just say it's, it's, I've been put in kind of a, a intermediate position on this because as you can understand, I can't go gung ho and say, I approve of everything that's going on here. I would have liked to see this go a, a different way than it has gone. I'd like to see these drugs be commercialized in a regular manner. Uh, and so forth and so on. But I do also appreciate, as the discussion came out yesterday, that there's a huge demand right now, and that even if we would have got approved, of, let's say from Gilead, our, our antibody could have moved uh, uh, a little bit faster with the FDA, that that still was a couple years, that, you know, no matter what we're talking about. And so we were, there was kind of faced with an immediate demand. I mean, people were just, the minute that paper came out, it was like the gates were open and cattle were, were uh, stampeding, you know. And so uh, I see what's happened as, and I even predicted what was going to happen. So uh, I had to put myself in a, in a situation of how, what was my, what was, what could I do the best in this transition period during this so-called Wild West uh, before, you know, down the line, maybe a couple of years, we have a number of products out there. Uh, and I thought the best way I could help was to, number one, accept emails. <laughs> I don't like phone calls, okay, so don't phone me. Uh, <laughs> okay, because once I get on the phone, it's hard for me to get off, you know? <laughs> and I talk too much. Uh, and then there's always question after question, you know, whereas an email just ends it right there. And that's, that's what you feel. So anyway, it's just email, but I try to answer, uh, every email, although there's some that are a little, get a little bit iffy that, that I might ignore, or I might make a little snippy comment, uh, on. but anyway, what I try, try to do is number one, encourage people to find veterinarians that know about this disease and work with them. You know, don't try to do this on your own. It's too hard uh, uh, to do it on your own. You're gonna have to monitor treatment. Uh, hopefully by doing this properly, we're gonna get information that we can use in the future. Like for instance, we still don't know, do we, uh, whether 12 weeks is the best time for treatment? That's what we ended up with, but, are, but can some cats be cured in six weeks, uh, eight weeks, 10 weeks? uh do some require even more treatment so uh, so basically we still have a lot of questions to answer and and so it's important and that's why i've asked these groups that are acting as intermediaries to encourage your people to gather information because we want to gain information out of this experience you know we want to know more so it's like a huge field trial out there we need to gain information so share your information now so number one i try to encourage uh, the involvement of veterinarians. 
And then I, I have to do a lot of hand holding, uh, I admit. Uh, and the biggest fear of everybody is when do I stop treatment? You know, everybody's sitting there like, you know, do I stop now? Everything looks good. Should I go on some more? Whatever. Uh, and then the other thing is that long wait that's after you stop treatment, that every day you're waiting for the shoe to fall. And I would like to have some way to make that easier on people. Uh, I, I do know that uh, if relapses occur, they tend to occur earlier than late, but we have had some that have gone out very late. So we've tried to set a date. That's a long time, it's a long wait. I've had to do a lot of hand holding and people that, that get, you know, the cat burps and then I get an email, you know? Uh, so, uh, so I have to say, stay the course, stay the course, you know, calm down. So anyway, that's the, the, the status you're, to answer your, uh, your, your question a little bit in a it's kind of a circular way. Uh, so, so I have a question uh, and that is, I mean, the title of this, your cat has FIP, now what? So I'd like to hear from the non-veterinarians first, uh, and then the veterinarians as to what you'd advise. Uh, Dr. Peterson kind of teed this up. So you get that email, guys, that are non-veterinarians from many, many people out there who connect with all of you for a variety of reasons. So my kitten, usually it is, has FIP, now what, Peter Cohen? Well, well, time out. Yeah. Well, I'm the moderator. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I young lady had a question up there, and you were on your way to meet her. Okay. Please finish that question. <laughs> that was who? Okay. We gotta fight with these people, you know? I got one calling me a crappy scientist, you know? That, uh, thank you so much. Um, we were talking about success stories, and I just wanted to add a story of my cat, Max. He got diagnosed with FIP in January at a time where the new study wasn't uh, published yet. And um, he uh, suffered from FIP for like five weeks. He had wet FIP, and um, I consulted more than 10 vets and three clinics. And um, I really didn't know what to do because the whole world was saying it's fatal and that I should euthanize him. I didn't want to believe that in this time, 2019, there's nothing to cure this. I had absolutely no knowledge about medicine, about cat diseases at all. So the only thing I had was hope, um, just to, to believe that there is something. And then the study, the old one, about the laboratory cats popped up and um, I started thinking, if there's a cure on this world, on this earth, I have to get it somehow. So I turned the whole world around and asked everybody I knew um, how I can get a hold of this medicine. And somehow somebody wrote me a message and said, I have one of these bottles. And two days later, I could start treatment. And then I was connected to someone in China and that's how it started actually. And this was a... Um, most emotional experience in my life actually because Mark survived. He was, um, like I said, suffering for five weeks and now he's um, four months post treatment and his blood work is all green. So um, he still have a little bit of liver problems, but there's nothing, that's nothing. So I'm so happy. <laughs> Just wanted to add this. And um, most importantly, I want to pass on all the information I gather to other cat parents, and that's um, what we do right now. So I just want to clarify, your cat has green blood work, but it's not a Vulcan, right? It's, um... <laughs> oh, I'm going to add on to Steve's prior question, and this is for Peter and Deb, uh, and because I know Deb would follow up with me after Luna went through treatment and if Dr. Peterson also wants to add to it, one of the questions that she had after it seemed like Luna was doing well, well, when do I get a rabies vaccine for her? When do I have her spayed? You know, what do I do in, you know, situations I think will be stressful for her, uh, after treatment? Do I have to worry? That sort of thing. Any comments to that from the board? So what I 
can talk about a little bit um, to follow up with what you said. Uh, when Luna was four months old, she came into heat. So I wasn't quite expecting that yet. I was thinking, oh, I have some time. This is also while she was undergoing her treatment. So we collaborated together and found a vet who would actually work with Dr. Peterson um, with what he recommended how to proceed with the surgery and what anesthesias and what medications to use. Feeling that the stress of you know her having heat cycles during the treatment would actually be harder on her than to go ahead or yes, and then to go ahead and get her spayed. Am I saying that right? So we did go ahead and, and have her spayed while she was on medication, and so that was that was very a little bit of a dicey time, a little scary, you know, to have her under you know under that stress. But she did really well. She had no issues whatsoever. So, but it was you know it was a, a group effort, it's a team effect, and we all worked together, and it took a a bit of a bit of time and, and tension, but it did, it did work. Yeah. yeah, we had we had that happen a number of times uh, with some of our intact females because some of these cats developed that by at a young age and they were kind of stunted in, in, in growth and everything kind of sickly. Uh, and then when we, and because of that, they probably were never taken into, there was some worry about taking in and spaying them. And they were young and there was probably time and that, but lo and behold, when we treated them and they started getting healthy and gaining weight like crazy, boy, they started coming into heat right, right and left. And so we had to deal with that. And so one of the ways, if, you, if we could wait, we asked them to wait if they could uh, take it uh, because we weren't sure, because the history so often was that the FIP appeared after the cat was spayed. We were always worried, is that a stress that's significant enough to interfere with the, the treatment. And so we came on this plan and, and, and uh, Luna was one of the first, uh, basically to get them in and out as with as little effort, you know, make the surgery fast, you know, don't have a lot of uh, extensive pre-medication and post-medication, uh, pain relief, all sorts of things. Just spay them like they do in the shelter get them back home, get them back into their normal environment and let them recover. And they go, and, and Luna went through this perfectly well. She went home in, a, in several hours and she, next day she was running around. So basically that's the approach that, that we took. And, but, we, but we're always fearful about, and I, I am cautious because again, we don't know about if you can wait on vaccinations, wait, you know, until we get through that period. Uh, let's not do a lot of things unless they're absolutely necessary. Lately, I've had a couple of Tomcats that have really gotten aggressive. And so so we did the same thing as uh, castrate them, but do it fast and get them back home with the least amount of effort. Right. And so with with uh, the va vaccines, uh, yeah, legally, we, most places might have to do a rabies vaccine. But if your cat's not at risk for getting that, there's no reason to hurry uh for the rabies vaccine and if you're not changing the environment much you're you're not in a particular hurry with the other vaccinations that that cats are, are getting as well so you could probably hold off on those provided those things are stable and you're not introducing new new things yeah okay <clears throat> okay and we also have some questions uh remotely here that we could take whenever you're ready. Yes. So this is a follow-up question to what you were talking about. Um, my Wompi is actually, um, in December 8th, he'll be one years old. He's not castrated yet. So I'm doing blood work for him uh, for the 12 weeks post uh, on Tuesday. If it comes back okay, is it okay for him to get him neutered? Yeah? Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. I'd have a veterinarian do it. <laughs> I also have a follow up question for Dr. Peterson. Um, so, so do you recommend using an ed NSAID for post-op pain due to the COX inhibition? Do you think that's a problem at all? You know, I'm an old fashioned vet, okay? And 
I believe you can spay and castrate cats very efficiently and without a lot of uh, fanfare before and after, and including extra medications. Uh, so you're probably asking the wrong person that question. And I have gotten in trouble uh, speaking at, uh, at ACDIM when I say, you know, uh, basically the same question. I say, you know, just do it and get them home the, the least stress possible. And, and we don't know the effects of all of these drugs. And there is evidence in human medicine that some of those drugs can have negative effects in that. And we were so, we were, maybe we were being overly cautious uh, because we were so frightened that we were going to do something that would change the course of treatment. But I, again, going back to being an old fashioned veterinarian, I think you can do a spay with minimal, uh, minimal stress and getting those animals back into their homes as soon as possible, get them back to normal activity, which is the least stress possible. So, uh, so is, do I believe that you should routinely use all of those things? No, but there are, there's big disagreement. As I said, I've said that at meetings that oh, I've been attacked. And that was actually the challenge um, when we went to get Luna Spade is the veterinary practice I use. You know, they require vaccinations before surgery and they, their, their big thing was pre-medicate, post-medicate, hold them for hours. And we, I actually had to find someone else, someone like older in practice that would agree to not make me have to vaccinate or make me have to pre-medicate, post-medicate. I mean, I brought her home asleep. She was still out. Okay, <laughs> they're great. So I mean, and she really did well. She did not need a single thing. And maybe she might argue with that, but she did really well. And Susan. Yeah. Okay, I don't have a cat currently. Um, haven't had a cat with FAP for a very long time, but I have been leading two support groups for many years, and learned a lot. Um, I know most of the people here are pretty savvy about FIP, but I imagine there are some people that don't know a lot. So I just wanted to share some of my, um, what, I, what I've learned. And it goes along kind of with what Deb was saying. First of all, the topic is my cat has FIP, now what? Does your cat have a FIP? There are so many vets I'm sorry, I'm not putting down vets. Every, they're busy and everything else, but they are not up to date on FIP. They still think that the only treatment is PRED. You never drain a cat. They don't do a CBC and a chem panel to even see what's going on. We have got to find a way to, in a simplified manner, maybe, I know it's complex, front or back, front and back document that every vet can have to help them know how to diagnose and to make them <laughs> get a little more up to date with all this information that is available that they don't have time for. And a lot of them don't like cats. I mean, that's just the truth of it. So it's so important that you have the right vet and that's a, the support groups are very helpful for owners because we have knowledgeable people that have we've ha had FIP cats ourselves, but we've also studied it. I mean, I um, we make great efforts to learn what's going on to keep up with research and all that. And sometimes, you know, we have offer information, and there are vets out there that like to learn, are open-minded. Think out of the box. Uh, I think the integrative vets are very helpful in treating FIP. So it's real important that you have a vet that knows what he or she is doing because that waste of time until you get a diagnosis um, can kill the cat, whether or not it's FIP or not. Um, the other thing too that I just want to mention is we're talking a lot about the GS, the Chinese GS. Yeah, it's wonderful. It's a miracle drug. Not everybody can afford it. And there are other things that have helped and do help cats live longer with FIP, with a quality life. I mean, we've come a long ways as far as um, trying to support them. Um, things you can do with nutrition, things, 
you know, a lot of things that you can do. We know so much more now. So what I tell people is, you know, first of all, make sure it's FIP. You know, if you need to go to a uh, internal medicine specialist for a consult, do it. You need a vet that's a good diagnostician. And not all vets are. You know, some of them will just want to run every test in the book and charge thousands of dollars when sending somebody to a vet like Dr. Peterson could give you the diagnosis right away. So it's really important. Um, it's a matter of life and death. But as far as the other treatments, there are other things available. Rescues can't, probably can't afford to buy the GS, but you can try the doxy and pred protocol to see if that helps. That's all I want to say, thank you. Glenn would like to I, you know, and I think we're still gonna have this problem uh, perhaps with the veterinarians. Please raise your hand if you're a UC Davis veterinary student. Okay. I know there's over 120 kids in each one of your classes. Where are they? All right. And uh, until we get a lot of FIP questions on the board exams, it's not going to be studied a lot. So that's maybe one avenue that we can make sure we, we try to address is who writes the board exams and make sure there's some FIP questions on them. And I think Glenn wanted to mention. Uh, I just want to go back to the question that was asked regarding pain management after um, a procedure in one of these kitties. I completely agree that you want to minimize stress. Um, that's extremely important. But cats, they do have a uh, similar path with pain pathways as, as, as humans. It is painful. Pain is uh, uh, causes stress. Um, I think you don't deprive an animal that you know has pain of pain medication. So I think you can use the NSAID safely um, during uh, the procedure and for a short time, let's say two, three days, bonds your or meloxicam, low dose meloxicam safely. And I think that's um, uh, good uh, patient care. Yeah, also, also with respect to, to vets, I mean, I think, and this isn't unique to FIP and for the pet owner people out there, I think one of the things you have to realize is that if, if you go into a vet clinic and you're going in with the disease that's hard to diagnose or disease that's pretty rare and I guess I'll be an ageist here, except for the, with the exception of the three students who are here now who clearly have their shit together. That <laughs> <laughs> the problem is, is that if you're not comfortable clinically making a diagnosis, you're gonna default to diagnostics because your knee jerk reaction is, I don't wanna miss anything. So I'm gonna run every single test to try and, and figure this out. Whereas people who are more comfortable with the diagnosis are gonna say, look, I don't need to run all those tests. I'm 99% confident your cat has whatever it is, FIP in this case. And you should always give multiple opinions. So no matter what, if you're getting a diagnosis of something awful, go to the, another vet because it's it's not the one vet's necessarily, the first vet's gonna be wrong. Maybe the first vet's right and the second vet's gonna confirm it. But the more information that you can get, I think will be very helpful and will decrease your stress because a lot of what we see in referral are people who are just stressed out of their mind because they come in thinking they either no one knows what's wrong with their pet or they've been given a diagnosis that's fatal and they don't want to accept it that it's fatal or they just need help coming to the resolution that it is fatal and so my in my career most of what i dealt with i'm an internist but 90 percent of my referrals were cancer you know they didn't know they were cancer i'm really good at finding cancer my job as an internist, I always thought was to keep the pet alive long enough to get cancer, and then it would go see the oncologist. You know, that that was sort of my, but we're used to helping people get to that point where, I don't, I'm not saying that you should accept the diagnosis, but at some point you have to accept the diagnosis and either work like some of these folks have aggressively in working with these groups and getting drugs and trying what you can but a lot of times we as vets just have to help you get through the fact is you got dealt a really crappy hand and this is probably gonna end very poorly. These are the things that we can do to help, uh, help you and help your family mitigate that. And then uh, hopefully that will make the process a little bit better. Okay, we do have some questions uh, from uh, around the world. Julie. All right, 
right. Um, this is for the veterinarians. Could U.S. veterinarians get in trouble with their professional bodies in their clients yes. if their clients use GS? Sorry, Sorry, I interrupted. No, that was basically it. So it is a yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, can I go on? Okay. Um, where can veterinarians? Uh, where, where can they find the information on monitoring cats using one of these drugs, compounds, side effects, how to address the side effects, etc. I would like to learn to work with these compounds, but obviously need resources. Some of us lurk on Facebook groups and are hesitant to post due to the unapproved nature of the compounds currently in use. Thank you for providing our community with a summary of resources available to us. I'd like to interlace with that um, question because as um, I think where um, Steve was getting to with his question earlier and what we do want to do with this panel is how do we use social media and all the groups that are out, out there, FIP Warriors, Stock FIP, whatever else is out there to make sure we have some place that someone can go to and at least know this is the factual data and the best we can do instead of, you know, you can go to the internet and Google anything but we want a couple places that we can trust to the best of our abilities. How do we move forward with places like that? Put your mic up a little closer, please. should uh, <laughs> should realize is that you actually know how to diagnose FIP better than anybody because you see it all the time. You've seen it in every ugly form, every age, every type of thing. Uh, and it frustrates when you go to the veterinarian and say, here's a cat that's got FIP and the veterinarian argues with you, you know? And so I think maybe veterinarians should learn, which all good veterinarians do, is listen to your clients, and and uh, and that's important. Uh, so to their to their credit, uh, you do get frustrated because you do know how to diagnose FIP. I can tell you that because I deal with owners all the time. Now, we had very few mistaken diagnoses. I, I know that uh, Dr. A.D. says that up to 40% of the cases that are referred to or do not have FIP. I did not see that. I, did, I really did not see that. Virtually every case that was uh, brought to our attention, either by a veterinarian or by an owner that came to me to be confirmed to be put on the trial, actually had uh, FIP with one exception, with one exception, which was a perfectly healthy a uh, kitten owned by a owner that was totally freaked out, you know, and so that was the only uh, only exception. So uh, I, I just want to say that to be gentle on the veterinarians and most veterinarians uh, actually with experience, the older veterinarians, as you saw even yesterday, the old veterinarians just jumped up and said, I don't have any problems making this diagnosis, see it all the time. And then you see others that, that say, well, this is very complicated and here's a series of things that you can do. Uh, but it, it, in essence, it's an odds game. And I really liked what Dr. Bruyette said and there was others that said, you know, the first thing that you do when you're dealing with uh, an owner as, as a veterinarian, they're bringing in a very sick cat. And so the first thing you do is you commiserate with him while you're doing your physical and taking your history and your other things, you commiserate with them and say, you know, Mrs. Jones, you have a very sick cat here. Uh, and, uh, you know, sick cats, that's a bad prognosis because there is an old saying that a sick cat is a dead cat, you know, and uh, there are, and 
But there's also another saying that cats have seven lives, and that's because they can survive uh, things all by themselves. Uh, uh, a serum, uh, a, a serum uh, chemistry profile. We're going to look at, look for these things. Is it anemic? Is it does it have high proteins? Blah blah blah. All that stuff. Uh, and then you present that data and say, "Now, Mrs. Jones, yes, uh, here we have this information. The odds now are pretty high that this cat has FIP. Now we need to talk about treatment. Uh, do we? Do you, do you feel comfortable with my diagnosis? Okay, if you do." then here are the options. You know, we treat it, we don't treat it, we treat it symptomatically, or we treat it. Okay, now if we decide to treat, this is gonna be expensive. Okay, it's gonna be consuming, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be 12 weeks of you giving injections and that cat's not gonna like it and you're not gonna like it, but you have to persist. So if you do it in a logical sense, now if the owner questions your diagnosis and says, I don't believe it, then load them on, you know, do, do the other stuff. You know, if it, if it, but eventually you're going to have to convince them. If you can't convince them, send them to a specialist uh, or whatever. But I think most people are going to be reasonable. I really do. I think uh, Dr. Olaf has a comment here. I, you know, I, the the you do too. All right. Do do we have to put more uh, batteries in the microphones for Neil's? No. <laughs> it works. <laughs> I, 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 I think I'm adding on to what Dr. Peterson's saying and hopefully answering that question about, you know, where's the resources to help me make a, this decision. I think what's important is to have a well-established um, veterinary client-patient relationship, but obviously you want the veterinarian to be educated regarding this disease. Um, and, you know, as a veterinarian, our role um, involves diagnostics, treatments, uh, uh, um, prevention, et cetera. But it also would, adds on to what he's saying is our role is education of the client and um, providing them with um, the information they need to make uh, a sound decision or a reasonable decision. And um, that's how I, you know, and you, you, I don't, you know, you, as interacting with human beings, you try to see if they understand what you're saying and are they smart enough to understand it? Do you need to leave? No, you figure it out um, and just provide them with information and help them make the decision. Um, and I just thought when I was listening to Dr. Peterson talk also with other sources of the veterinarians, maybe this one thing they could do is that Ben, D-I-N, Ben, not when, D-I-N, is a resource that many veterinarians use. So if the feline specialist on that um, uh, resource um, are well aware of things, then they, then these veterinarians, if they don't know, they can be asked to consult with them, the feline specialist um, via Ben, because believe me, almost all veterinarians um, are using Ben. Okay. I just want to kind of add on um, to what Dr. Peterson said about listening to your to your clients and move your mic up oh. a little closer. So I was that client that, you know, noticed that my cat was not acting right and had a swollen belly, felt warm to the touch. And when I went to the vet, you know, I explained all these things. That's why I went in. And there were no tests ran. There were there was no discussion of FIP. And I had actually already started, you know, kind of down that path as a nurse. Like I think like that. So I started doing a lot of research with that. And I thought, you know, why is her belly swollen? She's, she's 13 weeks old. Why does this cat have this swollen belly? Why is she so hot when I pick her up? So, you know, I don't feel that I was listened to properly. And I was told this is normal kitten. This is just a normal kitten. She also had a grade three heart murmur. So, but we're gonna refer you to cardiology, but we're also gonna go ahead and vaccinate her today. Yeah. So, you know, with that said, I, I guess I, I should have probably pushed it a little harder, but I, I, I listened to my vet. We went ahead and did the vaccine, we went home, and that was when everything went downhill. So when I'm, I guess the point I make is that we lost several days of um, 
you know, potential diagnostics because after the vaccination and after the fever got higher and she became more lethargic, you know, it was a couple more days we went to emergency vet. And that's when she was diagnosed. She had 105 degree fever, her belly, I mean, she couldn't even walk at this point. Her belly was so huge. So, you know, we lost several days, I guess is my point. And time is really important when you're dealing, especially with a case of wet FIP, these cats go downhill very quickly. So, you know, we do need to listen. We need to listen. You, just like we know our bodies when we go to the doctor, and our doctor needs to listen to us, we know our cats, we know their behavior, and we know when something's wrong. So to just um, to discredit that and to not listen and to, you know, make a referral on to something else, you know, there's a reason she had that murmur, you know, and, and that murmur went away as soon as her FIP went away. So, so there's that. So, yes, I can't, I can't stress enough the importance of really listening when, when your client comes in. Complain. To add one thing, um, and this is all, I mean, 14 years of dealing with FIP every day, trying to help people, cats dying. Um, we, we tell people you need to be assertive, that no one is gonna love your cat as much as you do. And although some vets may think they're gods, you're employing them, you're paying them. You have a right to have all your questions answered. If you don't understand, ask for further explanation. And, you know, sometimes we will suggest they, they go to another vet. And even, even the internal medicine or cat only practices. Ask if the vet you're going to see has current FIP information, especially about diagnostics. I mean, it's like, you know, Deb said, a day matters. You know, a, a, a vet taking two weeks to decide they're going to send in the order form for the feline omega interferon, that matters. <laughs> you know, so we have to do this for our cats. And I don't think you vets really mind. Now, we don't come in there saying we know more than you because, well, I'll never know as much as a vet. You know, I never will, but I know a heck of a lot about FIP and um, I have a lot I can share too. <laughs> I know they have questions. Let me just add to this because it's very, uh, the continuity, um, because I'm thinking, I think what people are wondering is like, well, uh, where are the veterinary resources? I think that you, you made a good point. Um, look at feline specialists. That's one source that like ABVP dot is it .com or .org? .org, .org. So see if there's a, fe a feline specialist clinic that only sees cats and hopefully you ask the questions like Susan said, um, are they up to date on issues you know, regarding FIP? Um, and not everybody has to be a feline specialist to be up to date with feline medicine because you can find feline only clinics and you can ask the same questions. Um, then there's some very, very good veterinarians that are feline only that are uh, feline specialists. So search them out in your local community and find the vet that um, is the right fit for you. I just wanted to add um, on the comments in regards to veterinarians and a couple of key things came up yesterday with Dr. Barker and Dr. Hartman. Your two, you know, veterinarians and, a, and I'm addressing the veteran students in the group your best resources really are yourself and using your five senses when you go in. I've written a chapter on history and physical exam. And the important thing is get a good history, do a good physical exam, you know, and history is listening and you can ask good questions. So your best resources before you even get into tests is yourself and focus on that, develop that. Hi, I'm a practicing veterinarian, um, cat special, a cat veterinarian, and I'd like to get back to the last question from um, the public about our resources. And I'd like to put this back to Peter and Susan and Deborah about what, where did you contact about getting information? So I, as a veterinarian, know where your contacts are and how I can help you better when you, someone does come to me uh, wanting to know all the information. Well, I mean, I 
actually um, was one of the founders of the FIP support. Well, I was a member of FIP support, ended up leading it. FIP fighters group. We, I put research on the website. Um, a lot of it was experience and learning. I mean, I knew nothing about FIP when Bria died, nothing. I blamed the breeder. I didn't know any better. Um, and it's, it's gradually just being interested enough in finding out about FIP, looking at the research, we put a lot of resources together. We have questions and answers and everything else. So your question about social media, social media, if it's good social media, it can be really helpful. Our new group that we were starting on IO groups, I hope it'll be good because we will, it'll be balanced. It's not going to be a group that we only support the research of one researcher. You know, it's going to share information and there will be resources there. And we, on FIP Fighters, we have documents that, that um, owners can take to their vets. Maybe the vet um, isn't as up to date on FIP, but is interested. We, sh we can share information too, so it's kind of a two-way street. I don't know if that answers your question, but... You've given me a resource that my clients are going to, and, and, and a good one that I know is reputable. I want to hear what Peter would recommend. So through Zen by Cat, I'm contacted three or four times a day from people all over the world who have FIP cats. And usually they're um, desperate and they're trying to find the drugs. They've already heard about these drugs. And I connect them with uh, the groups have changed, but currently I, I usually send them to FIP warriors uh, and I tell them all the risks and the costs. And it's often their, their vet doesn't want anything to do with this, especially in other countries. Uh, and they're doing it themselves. And these groups, uh, as I said, FIP warriors, and there are others, uh, help them uh, not only figure out uh, if the drugs are for them, how to use them, how to get them. Um, and in my experience, uh, at that point, the, the owner just wants to treat their cat. Um, and I, I totally understand that uh, ultimately we want uh, legal drugs that are easy to buy through vets. Uh, but at this time, uh, the only course is these social media groups that can connect to the sellers who are also, uh, these are people trying to save cats. I understand every company wants to make money too, but these are not evil people. They're all like us. So my, uh, well, Zimbai Cat's main focus uh, remains to uh, raise money because as everyone on this panel has said, uh, this is just the very first step. These are not meant to be the end, they're the beginning. Uh, but the person who contacts me doesn't care about that. They're just desperate to get their cat uh, treated and their vets uh, won't help them or don't know how to help them. Um, so that's my two cents. I would also like to make sure that we encourage people that they, um, have established a good relationship with a veterinarian prior to walking in the door with a crisis and here's a cat with FIP. I'm upset, I'm angry, I do everything, do anything. But, um, you know, we should all be establishing good relationships where we've already found a good reasonable vet that we can interact with by doing wellness exams and, and uh, doing the little things also um, that uh, a cat should have um, before walking in the door with a crisis. So you should actually already have a veterinarian that you're very comfortable with to walk in the door with and help get a diagnosis for FIP. Uh, catvets.com, by the way, that's the correct website of the American Association of Feline Practitioners is catvets.com. Dot org, she says, I just looked. So while we get the next question, I will look again to There's see. Hold three, on. Three questions out there right now. Oh, okay, okay. All right. We're getting a lot, and this one in particular, this whole subject, this one's coming from Spain. Uh, thanks for the symposium. Um, how in our country, the veterinary community is concerned about the possible legal consequences that veterinarians who are involved with specific treatments such as GS with their patients could suffer in their licenses. How would the experts present today, recommend, present today, um, recommend that we handle this issue and 
there's several of these that are wondering how they how they should be going through all this process for you know the legal aspects. So much. Uh, there is a definite legal problem with buying for a veterinarian to buy this drug on the black market and then resell it to uh, an owner. That really opens it all up to a lot of different business things. First of all, they're actually not only buying the drug, it's not the, uh, All right. Two are better than one. <laughs> Actually, buy, buying the drug and reselling like that is illegal. But the other thing, prescribing that drug opens them up. If something happens, let's say it doesn't have FIP or the cat dies or for some reason they're unsatisfactory with the treatment or the way the treatment is monitored, they can bring up uh, charges to the board and the boards exist in all countries are very similar. And that board is going to look at it and say, is that veterinarian practicing the standard of care you would expect for this country or this region? And they're gonna say no in that circumstance because right away they're using a, a drug that's not approved and they're selling it to, uh, to their client. So I look at that as a, a no-no. But if you look at the oath that most veterinarians take, you know, it's like our Hippocratic oath, you know, but we have an oath that we also take. And that is to really help and be, you know, to, to uh, end suffering and all help and prevent suffering and all this other stuff. So just read that oath and say, if what am I doing? Is anything that I am doing by, let's say, if an owner comes to me with a cat with FIP, and says, look here, I, I can get the drugs, would you help me? Now, is there anything in that oath from that particular country or that that would preclude you from doing that? And if there isn't, then you are within the standard of, of care. So I look at it that way. Uh, and, and basically, if they do pick to bring you up to the board, you can say, listen, this is my oath. This is what I've, I've done. This person came to me and said, I need help. You know, my animal is suffering. Do I have some sort of a, a duty? Now, they also have the right to say, no, I don't want anything to do with this, okay? And I can understand certain veterinarians doing that because that immediately just takes them right out of the whole situation. There's no longer any debate. They're no longer under any uh, legal problems or potential problems. So again, I would answer it that way, is that look at your oath and is there anything that you're doing in this situation that would be counter to whatever your oath is. You can keep back. Uh, there were some questions back here. I'll get to as many. By the way, it is .com. So it's what I said, which was what? Catvet.com. Yes. So mine's not kind of a question. I'm just sort of answering for, you, for vets out there. You can join FIP Warriors, and FIP Warriors not only has thousands of cases that are being treated, that you can observe what we are doing because people do document every day, weight, temperature, changes. You can also private message any admin and we will direct you to a vets only group. So you can speak to other vets, vets that are observing treatment um, and kind of be bipartisan to that. Thank you. I'll hold on. I will do this. Let's see how many steps I get today. Go ahead. Okay, I just want to speak to um, social media. Um, I'm an RVT, and a lot of clients come in that have first consulted Dr. Google. And they have preconceived, you know, opinions of what's going on. Um, how do we keep the message clean? How do we, you know, I mean, there's quacks out there. And that, that concerns me because people read that stuff. They're desperate. Well, as I was sitting here, I'm, I'm thinking, well, okay, we have several sites that we can approach. Then uh, the feline practitioner site, um, we can uh, use some of the current social media sites. Um, 
uh, wind foundation where we could maybe collect up consistent information and post it all exactly the same at each one of these places. But now I'm also sitting here wondering, are you opening yourself up to some problem if you start posting, treat the cat like this? This is the treatment and and, and I don't know the answer to that. You, I think the, board, the panel and you guys have to answer that. So I think that's what everybody's looking for out of this right now is somebody tell me exactly what kind of treatment I'm gonna give and I'll convince my vet to help me do that so that I can do it on my own. And I'm very leery about doing that, but I think that's what people want, right? So um, where do we stand where we can legally do something like that? I'll comment and I have no idea if this is right or wrong. First of all, thank you for telling me that. So I'm, I joined all of these groups. I don't ever post because I'm fearful that whack jobs will come out of the woodwork and start you know, haunting me down and wanting to do evil things to me. I think it's great that there's that, that admin part so I will get to, with somebody and, and connect with the vets. I think it's what I would, what I do is I troll, I go to all those websites and I've learned a lot about what people are thinking and what they're doing and what their rationale is but I haven't really learned anything about what I would do with the drug when someone walked in the door. What I would do if someone came to me and said, I've got a, clip, I've got a Ziploc bag with no label on it and a, a vial of clear liquid and a glass jar, I'm gonna go, what the hell is wrong with you? It would be my first response. My second response would be, if that goo is GC or GS, here's the paper that's published in a peer-reviewed veterinary scientific journal, this is the recipe I would follow. If you want me to help you monitor your cat, fine. But I'm not going to inject your cat with this liquid goo and I'm not gonna participate in anything other than what's, what's published. And until such time that people publish more stuff and maybe there's an opportunity for people, I think it's a problem, I'm, I'm gonna guess, it's probably a hot mess and how data is showing up on these websites to actually put it together into a meaningful document that people that veterinarians could use, I think would be super hard and very challenging. And I'm sure if we put all the board, if we put all the people who've been talking here for the last two days to review it, there would be some heated discussions about what's right and what's wrong. But for me, it would just be, I think the websites are helpful in what's going on, but in terms of dose and what to do, I just say, this is what Niels did. I would do that. And until somebody else publishes something different, I would say I would do what Niels did and I would do that and I'll help you do that part, but the rest of it. Yeah, and I agree with whoever was talking about the websites. I mean, this doesn't apply to FIP. I've dealt with weird diabetic websites and weird lymphoma websites, Uncle Billy Bob's website, you know, to treat whatever disease is written by some wackadoodle. The, the population is a bell-shaped curve. Veterinarians are no different than the general population. Two and a half percent of them are like him smarter than anybody you'll ever meet, two and a half percent, I don't know how they get out of bed in the morning, more or less <laughs> practice what they're doing. So, you, you know, the it, the webs, and I've, I've tried to lobby in California that pet owners need to be microchipped, that you, the pet owner, need to be microchipped. And that when you're microchipped, when you get near a computer with internet access, it should just turn it off. Because it's, as a vet, I think I do a disservice to people if I tell them, go to the internet and figure this shit out on your own. If I tell them, go to the internet to these four sites that I think are okay, that I think the information's not totally wacky, then I feel better making that recommendation. But I have a hard time saying, yeah, go go to Dr. Google and figure it out because you will find all kinds of weird myth out there. So. Well, I'm also just wondering how did people decide to go to five milligrams per gig and to 10 milligrams per gig when the published papers are at two and four. So how, how did that happen? Just more is better? Is that what somebody's thinking? Yeah. No, I, uh, let me answer that. My, <laughs> my, my guess on the five is that there was a little uncertainty on the part of those people that were making and selling the drugs said, well, you know, he says four, I'm going to give you a little bit more, so I'll give you five. But but I'm, I'm willing to bet that that's I'm, more. I'm thinking fives for me with the, you know, the <laughs> challenge people that can divide by five easier than four. 
<laughs> yeah, that it, it's possible, but I, 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 we know that there probably. I, I don't think there's any scientific, a lot of scientific data saying that five is better than four or that. But I, I do know that we did, we did kind of make it known. I'm talking about we being UC Davis, based on our experience with cats that have neurologic FIP, which was only published in part in that paper. So, but we added five more, four more, more cases after that, that in some cases we had to escalate the dose dosage. And so when people would contact me about cats that had neurologic FIP, which there's a lot more than you think out there, and they were getting good responses, but not quite as good as you could, then we said, well, okay, escalate by two. Okay, then, then we found that they got better. So, but not, they're still not gaining weight as good and they still have so okay, escalate by two more. So basically this, this was based on maybe unpublished research, but like everything, it, because there's a group out there working here and I'm trying to uh, work with them the best I can, because I don't want to see cats with neurologic FIP treated with too low a dosage or mistreated. Once those people have committed, I want to see success. You know, I don't want to see failure. So, so a lot of this is from me. Okay, so I'll take any blame for for any of those those kinds of things. So we, in a way, we got ahead of publications. But this whole thing has got ahead of, in a way, of, of publications. And so, uh, but back to one question that kind of came out of that. I think your description of the goo is actually the best ever. You know, because your face is that area with a client that comes in with a little vial of clear something, you know, with no label on it or very little label on it. And you're depending on those owners bringing you something that is actually what it's supposed to be, you know, and that uh, that is, uh, uh, I think that is where maybe the experience of groups like FIP warriors and others who are monitoring all of this treatment out there can can actually say you know it seems to me that these drugs here work i'm not so sure about these over here uh or whatever but i'm pretty sure about these and so again this is all anecdotal right it's a little bit uh, anecdote so we have to trust that what people are seeing by using these products are what they are. So that if something comes from this manufacturer, we know from experience that five milligrams works really well in most cases, and, and maybe on neurologic you need a little more. Uh, you might say, well, this, this product uh, stings a lot more than this product, or this you have more skin. So these are anecdotals that are coming out, but I don't know how to stop that. I really don't know how to stop that. It's gonna be, and so, we said this was a wild west. The wild west was a necessary part of the evolution of the United States of America, right? We had a wild west out there, uh, and there was uh, gunslingers, and there were uh, there was sheriffs that uh, there was hangings, and there was all sorts of things doing going on until the country got uh, uh, populated and domesticated, right? So. This is where we're at, guys. I don't know what more to say. So this is, uh, you know, I'm, so I'm wondering, there's a lot of data out there. There's now this term called citizen science, where uh, for many different things, even in genetics, that we are relying upon citizens to help provide data on their animals. So uh, there's something in genetics called Darwin's Ark that is a whole thing on dog genetics and stuff. So I'm wondering, is there some better way we could capitalize on all these animals that are being treated in, so that we could collect the data a bit more formally? Um, I'm wondering, actually, are the representatives from, uh, um, from China still here? What is, when, when the drug is purchased, do, they, do you do any attempt to collect data and, um, and see what happens with the drug that you've sent out, actually. Um, so I'm wondering, can you guys think of better ways that we could maybe use this citizen science to a benefit for everybody? So 
Hold on a second. Right behind you. So our nonprofit is actually looking at some apps that are out there, um, very similar to when a woman is pregnant and she wants to track her symptoms. And then when the baby's born, monitoring the baby, monitoring the baby's poop, what you're feeding the baby, the weight, the progress of the baby. Well, there are some new apps out there for pets. And some of these apps we are currently testing. And um, they have where if you're, um, you sign up and your records, they will contact the app the person manufacturing the app or distributing the app, there's one called, um, well, I'm not gonna tell you what it's called because we haven't validated it yet, um, but this is one that we're highly looking at for such a thing. Because if we can get pet, as a breeder, if I can get, if I sell my cat, my cats to pet owners, and I say part of the contract is, you must report back to me to help improve my breed, in the breeding program report back to me on the health of the cat and if we can work in unison together with our pet owners and our veterinarians um, this particular app will go out and and contact the vet that you put down and they will upload the vet records into the app so so the pet owner will have that information then from and you can the pet owner can then give access to other people such as study partners, such as my nonprofit or, or whatever, that are universities, and then can say, okay, we've collected this data on these breeds of cats or what have you, and here are some, you know, the blood work. So this information then gets easily transferred between organizations. And if we can do this universally without a ton of cost, without a ton of headache, with where you don't know have to know technology you just have to know a, you know your cell phone and we're almost there you know the younger gen i see this happening with the 20 and 30 year olds i think that an app like this in 20 years is going to be the way that we're going to manage um, our pets records and sharing that information so then when we try a new drug um, for instance i contacted this company uh, because there was a new drug um, a new form of the drug to treat trichomonas and it wasn't in there so I asked him to put the drug in there so when a pet owner needs is prescribed the drug it gets put in there and then they put how they're administering the drug and then what are the side effects so they can keep this log and it's like a baby log right. of your baby growing up and this is just a beginning right well uh, certainly electronic health records is a big thing in, in uh, uh, all healthcare, and so I can see those uh, that also wanting to become a, a bigger thing for veterinary healthcare. It would help me with a lot of genetic projects as well. But just out of the people that have actually treated their cats, what kind of records did you keep? Do you do you have detailed records? Do you have a lot number actually on that drug that came to you? Is there a lot number on? No lot number on the drug. Okay, well, date. How about date as far as when it was received and how it got to you? Do you keep things like that? You know, very detailed things. So, um, my cat was actually one of the first to use the oral med with the neuro, and I kept a log every day temperature, weight, what meds he was given, um, when I got the pills, how much he was given. So it was a detailed record every day of what, how he progressed. His labs, everything were in there. So I do have all that data. On which brand? Which drug? Which drug? GCGS. A version of GS. So, yes. There's questions behind you. So, is this the Mucian stuff? Okay. So, I, again, on the, on the website, I'm trying to figure out. So, are there, how many different things are there? How many different products are being looked at on the site? It, yeah. Three, four, there's perhaps, I don't, I don't want to name brand. Sure. Um, so I want to give you the microphone though. Okay. Um, 
Sometimes people remotely cannot hear you. Thank you. Um, so on FIP Warriors, there's four. Currently, there are a couple of others. So here's the problem. So brands pop up and leave all the time. So we're like, is this brand really this old brand remarketed and repackaged? Packaging changes uh, quite often because of the nature of the smart of getting things to the parents. So. So uh, and with that, of those four things that yes. that are there, are they the same molecule? Like there's GS blah blah blah. Are they all GS blah blah blah? Is there GS well, blah blah goo? I mean, what what? They are supposed to be, but I think with Gilead, there's companies saying it's not quite four four one five two four. That it's something else. Is it? Isn't it? Question mark. Like it's their okay. own version of the molecule. Like there's five seven three four or something. It's like okay. So, but no one's taken four bottles of, of the goo or a capsule of the goo and run it through some machine and said it's the goo that they Maybe. Say. Ha, you mean have, have we run these bottles through a machine? I can neither confirm nor deny okay. that at some point all four of these brands have been tested for biological activity. For biological activity? Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean? Like you put- Actually, you like they're stuff. active. You just look to see if the chemical they said was in there was I can in neither there. confirm nor deny that no, they- No, because act activity is different than <laughs> thing. Right. So if they say it's one, two, three, four, five, you get, you assayed it and it is one, two, three, four, five. As far as we know. Okay, no, no, I don't, I'm, I'm just. But just let me comment on that. Uh, I guess the answer would be no, that there is no test that you could run it through and say this is ES, uh, 441524, 99% pure. Yeah, okay, okay. But there have been some tests looking at biologics. Does, does this stuff have antiviral activity? Uh, yes or no, and yes. But also you confirm that by the fact that the cats do respond to these drugs mm -hmm. the same. Niels, but, Niels um, can't, can't someone do mass spec and figure out if this is the same compound or not? No, so, but somebody has to do that, yeah, and it's okay. not going to be me, okay? I, right. I don't want to get involved in it. <laughs> but yes, yeah, somebody could do that, and that, that may be something that has to come, come along. But I can tell you already that some of, some of the different brands, some, of, some is light yellow, some is clear, some is more gooey than others, uh, and uh, some has a slight lo lower, even lower pH than others. Some stings a little more than, is that right? Uh, and as far as the oral form, sometimes the capsules are different or different sizes and that. So there is variation there and that is worrisome. So, but again, it goes along with what we've said before. This is, this is the wild west. Okay, so, something I wanna point out, the packaging changes because there is a problem with importation, is that right? And so you hence then have customs maybe kicking these these packages out and not delivering them, is that right? The post office, yeah, post office and customs. So that's why the change in the packaging, So perhaps, Just real quick, perhaps. back to the goo, because I'm fascinated with the goo. Yeah. The, when you guys yellow are goo and white goo, apparently. Because I think <laughs> you, you're sitting on a lot of information that there is potential. And to Neil's point, that whatever the goo is, if the cat gets better, that's a good thing. But it would be interesting to know which cats are getting better with which goo. So if you're tracking X number of cats got treated with this goo and 80% got better, 20% died, that's potentially helpful information. Even if, you know, even if you're not telling or revealing what's in the goo, that would be helpful. At some point, somebody, some company is going to buy goo and analyze the goo and find out what the goo is. That's how people make new goo, is to, to see what's going on. So I think it would be a benefit if you're, if you're keeping, if you're keeping those kinds of records where you at least know what the cats are getting and you don't change, like halfway through, they change from goo one to goo two. That's they have to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We need to. We. I would need to run back with the microphone, but we have, we have a question right here. I was just wondering who you guys were 
um, and you seem to know a lot about these the goo. Um, they're goo warriors. They're goo warriors. Okay. <laughs> and there's a lot of dancing around the issue, and I, I understand people don't want to get sued, people don't want to get thrown under the bus, but we want to be helpful to future cats with FIP. So can you just tell us a little bit more about where you're coming from? <laughs> yes. Are you an adventure? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's fire. Um, <laughs> Let's just call you Sue. I call me Sue. Uh, my name is Latisse. This is Alicia. We are currently from FIP Warriors. Um, Alicia does have a cat. I wish she still talked about Mushu, who was cured. I do have a trial cat. Um, so that's how I originally came to this through the trial. Um, so through the traditional channels and then found my way somehow in the, the back alley channels. <laughs> um, does that help? I don't know what, did I, I not say that? We're admin from the FIP Warrior page. And the, so the, as admins on the FIP Warriors, do these, these drugs, these, the, the goos that are coming in, do they go to like FIP Warriors and then you guys dispense them to clients or how does, how is that happening? No. No. No, we connect people. It's very much like you someone mentioned the buyers the club. Someone mentioned buyers club. It's very much like, oh, okay. hey, someone will message me in Phoenix. I have a cat with suspected FIP. Here's the blood work. Can we look at the blood work? Vets will chime in, look at the blood work too. Yes, it has the markers, 95% certain that we've confirmed this is FIP case. Following the protocol. That's the vet admin group of FIP warriors that looks at that or? Who's, mm -hmm. oh. So it's the what? You, you had mentioned there's a veterinary group behind There it. is a oh. veterinary group that has a chat that they um, have a closed group that they talk about vet questions. There are a few veterinary members who will just comment on blood work. Okay. Yes, no, I see this, I see that only. Um, it's much more of a, I know someone in Phoenix, so we have a suspected FIP 95% certain based on these factors. Um, who else do we know treating in the area? Here are some people we know also treat. So it becomes more like a, these are a other global pet, network. These are other pet owners who yes. are treating. Okay. So thank you for, for doing that because it is helpful. But one of the main problems that we have now is Nobody knows what's in these bottles. They're, they're good. And so you can collect all the information you want, but until there's a standardized drug that's available, a lot of this data is going to be tainted. It's all we've got now. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I think we all feel in this room that we're not going to let our patients die up. We can help them. Um, but it is the Wild West out there, and we're all trying to do the best we can with this. All right. We have a comment from Peter down here. So I just want to say, I understand where you're coming from, and I. But these people are trying to help their cats. And yes, we know, even if the goo was tested, uh, we don't know that the goo that comes next week. But we, we accept that. And uh, FAP Warriors and others, uh, this, this group, I'll just talk about that one because I know it, went from three people to 8,000 in five months. And these are people, they're not vets in the beginning. These are just people who are trying to save their cats. And now they've created this incredible group that is getting drugs to, to cat owners. And everything you say is, is correct, and we, we are terrified that uh, one day uh, someone's cat's gonna get something that, that isn't right. Uh, that is a real possibility. But they want your help. So uh, to the extent that you say, you know, how can, you, how can we, I, I wanna say we should support these people. And they want to, they are collecting data, and if the data isn't in the right format, then they are very open to help to get it in the right format. Uh, this is the first time we were able to talk about this openly. Everyone is afraid that uh, we, we don't want it to get stopped. Uh, and we understand absolutely uh, Juliet and others who, who spent money and they, they want to protect their rights. No one is disputing that. But today, the only way you can cure an FIP cat is through these companies that are selling the drug this way. As you said, sometimes it's intercepted. Sometimes uh, um, it doesn't get through. We, we all accept that. I just want to say uh, we're all on the same side and the criticisms, uh, when, you, when you explain all that to someone who's trying to save their cat, they don't matter. Um, they, I, 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 I'm just not a fact 
breakfast. And and I I want to point I'm out. Support, I mean, all of you, all of the pet people out there with cats with FIP, we're trying to make a drug for FIP. I want five drugs on the market for FIP. You know, that would be fantastic. What I don't want is some goo to contaminate the development of drugs because people get, oh, that doesn't work when it's not the goo that we're trying to make, you know? So I think it's very helpful. You guys are gonna be really helpful to us and other companies who try and advance it because you're the people we're gonna go to and say, we wanna do studies with our goo. We, and you've got a network of people that you can put together. That's all fantastic. Um, you know, that's very helpful. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had goo to sell, but I have no goo to sell. Right. The, um, but I think I, most of my questions are coming completely out of ignorance as to what's happening. You know, I see what's happening and I get it. We've done this before. Again, FIP, you guys are passionate about FIP, but I've dealt with diseases where people wanted to bring drugs in from outside the country. Um, we've had this happen time and time again. I just, I'm just trying to understand what you're doing. That's all. I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. I, I, I would also like to point out we're, we're using the, the term goo, but, uh, but some, of, some of these chemicals could be very, very well constructed and, and very good chemistries. And, and so we don't mean to be derogatory all the time. What, but we, we want to point out that when it is the Wild West, one person, one group might be making a very valid and very good drug. And then as competition comes in, and you try to lower the floor and get something cheaper and cheaper. Well, how are they making that cheaper and cheaper drug? That's what you got to worry about and who gets that lot of that drug. And so that's, I think, what I'm really afraid of is that uh, there are certainly very good companies that are making very good drug, but what's going to continue to happen that now there's more than three or four of them, um, we want to then it's opening a, a very much more difficult situation. Right. And well, no, 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 we're, we're kind of going in order here. So Dr. Thayer's had her hand raised for a while. And I also think that I'm glad we're having this discussion because it's an important discussion to talk about and to bring this out and actually talk about it and to share, as you said, information, Dr. Thayer. I think in addition to what Dr. Bruett is, is alluding to is that we, aren't getting information on which cats may not be responding to the goo as far as treatment. Um, you know, do we have failures out there? Because you can learn from those situations too, and we need that information on how do we adjust and are we getting that? That's a question in addition. I mean, when we, and I'm just going to keep talking until someone says shut up. But, you know, when I go, when I'm reading the posts every day, the thing, and I totally agree with you, the thing that I'm most interested in is not that the cat's doing better because I expect that they're getting the stuff they're going to, they're getting better. But the cats that aren't getting better and the cats that die, I think are more interesting. It's like, well, why did that happen? And are those patients taking something different than the cats who are doing better? And that I'm just encouraging you guys, if you're not doing it, to, that's super important for you to know what's happening there so you can make this and and remember earlier in our discussions as we were talking about hiv the, it's a three drug treatment and we recognize that that might be very likely that we're going to need that for fip as well and we want to make better treatments that it's not a 12-week treatment it's a one pill treatment or something like that and so being able to collect this data and 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 the information that's behind it will help us potentially to get there. But it has to be done in a very, very um, logical and scientific manner. Uh, to be clear, uh, a manufacturer is in the room from one of those and the Wind Foundation wants everyone who wants to speak to speak and uh, you're next. Uh, my whole point was that not all of them just come in random bottles of goo. Some are labeled consistent and I know during my treatment it was always the same. During her treatment, all the bottles were always the same. So it's not always some random envelope with a different color goo each time. There are standards with some. Is, and same. that's the mucin? That may be what I use. Because when I see that box and post, and again, this I've never seen the box of them posted on your website. Yep. It, it says 50 milligrams or whatever, but doesn't say 50 milligrams of what? You know, it says 50 milligram of something. It's, it's, it's a term, it's not a chemical name. So it's in the back of the box. There's something else on the other side of the box? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you look on the website, it's on the other side. Yeah. 
And it says what? It says 50 milligrams to GC 4572. Oh. Okay, so, uh, as you mentioned, which you know already. So, uh, when you check the website, there's a picture there, and there are ingredients at the back of the box. So, we are not like other suppliers. I'm not going to say anything bad about them. So Mutian is standard GMP manufacturer in China. Uh, we have different compounds, so we have no patent problem. And uh, we are going to be legal in the US and uh, we have no issue with customs. Yes. So what you mean legal in the US meaning what? You're, you're going through FDA approval? So it's kind of conditional approval, but not like FIP treatment approval. That's going to cost another 14 years, maybe. So you're going so, like a supplement route? Something like that, just to, okay. to make available legal to the market, to these cat owners. OK. Once so, to save their cat. Over counter, yes. OK. Yes. So, you're, so you're going the over the counter route without making a claim for treatment. You're saying it's not for the treatment of FIP, it's for support of cat health or whatever. Some, Something like, like that. that, yes. Okay, and then all of the ingredients that are in there are being, have been considered by the, 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 by the regulators as grass. They're generally regarded as safe. So Is when that we um, handing the application to FDA, we have to submit our ingredients. They have to check. Right. So yes, that's what we did. Okay. So you you you'll get a grass designation basically for all the ingredients to allow you to sell. What is that? Grass. So you don't. Okay. There there's a thing. It's generally regarded as safe. So supplements, nutraceuticals, over the counter, non-regulated products. There is a path. There's a book. You can look. You know, any ingredient that goes in, if it's listed already as a grass ingredient, the government usually says, okay, it's safe, we're not going to do anything about it. If you're not in the book and you don't have a molecule that falls under that, then you have to petition to get into that. And that takes a, a lot of time and a lot of money to get grass certified. That's not an efficacy, you know, you see the commercials all the time on television. The FDA has not said this is safe or effective, but those ingredients are grass. They're, they're thought to be non-harmful, but they don't make claims about benefit because they can't. So, so the product that you guys are selling then that your business plan is to bring that product to the market as an over the counter supplement, nutritional or otherwise, generally regarded as safe without a specific claim. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to talk. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I wanna. Uh, say something about our Mutian plan or around the world. So first thing, we have to make it legal first, then people can get it and uh, it's safe for vets to tell people they can get it. That's the first thing. The second thing is we are not only manufacturing these drugs, we are doing research. So we have scientists and uh, we are cooperating and working with a couple of hospitals in Europe or in the US, Asia. So they have cats, uh, they have trials. They test our drugs for probably like 30 cats per hospital like that. We sponsor that for free. So they see how it works and uh, how it goes through. And then they start recommending people to get these drugs. So I think that it's kind of period, kind of revolution, because it's a hard time, always hard time for the first one to do stuff like that. So we kind of going through some difficulties here, but I think the result will be good. I have a question. Or it, go, yes. It will only be the oral form though, not the injectable. Yeah, injectable. Mm, okay, so I think injectable is impossible to go through the FDA because it must be prescriptive. Yeah. It has to be a long time. Yes. So, uh, okay. yes. The, my other question, so the, the, the active ingredient, whatever the active ingredient is, is it a, a protease inhibitor or a nucleoside analog? Is it comparable to the drugs that we've been talking about for the last couple of days? So uh, I am not the specialist in this compound stuff. Right. So um, what I can say is there 
we have a different compound. Okay. Then the, it's active working for FIP. Yes. Okay. Yes. But it, not a small molecule nucleoside analog or a protease inhibitor. Um, if it's, you need kind this info, I can um, prepare it and uh, send to your email. Okay. But, but, yeah, because uh, I'm just curious yes. about how the the grass pathway is going to work. <laughs> Understand, yes, but uh, as I said, I'm not from the lab, so I'm not sure. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. You know, with most human drugs, they may start off being tested by injection, but the, the goal is always to make them oral. So you could, out, you could make a lot of drugs oral by, oh, well, well, first of all, we know that, that GS and probably GC, we've already done the PK studies and orally they're not uh, uh, absorbed maybe 30%, 20%, something like that, but they're not absorbed as well as by injectable. So our research was only to do the optimum. L let's give it the optimum way. We only have so much money. We only have so many cats. We can't test different formulations. Okay, so the question here is, you know, is the active ingredient, is the final ingredient that inhibits the virus. Is it a nucleoside analog, ad adenosine nucleoside analog, just like identical to GS441524? That is the active ingredient in the end. That ingredient is triphosphorylated. That is what kills the, that's what causes chain term, RNA chain termination. I don't care how it's given, what you hang, what aryl groups or alkyl groups or whatever else you do to make it uh, oral, uh, or whether you just increase the dosage that you're given orally so that uh, it, you will achieve the, the uh, effective levels. I don't, it doesn't matter, but, but the question I'm asking you is the, is the final product GS, or GS44152, or is it, and the triphosphate of that form is the active ingredient, is that the case or not. Okay, so the compound, uh, you are still mentioning about GS. I think the most important thing is when I come out this compound, maybe if you want, you can test it to see if it's GS. The research, it's based on GS, but it's special designed for the cat. So it's not actually GS. We change the compound and we are applying our own pattern. And I, and I, I get that it's not GS, but it, I, we, keep going back, we keep going back to the same thing. Is it a nucleoside analog? <laughs> because, I know, cause if, it's, if it is, it's a drug, yeah, so and they're not going I'm to. I'm not going to answer this question. As I said, yeah. if you need more detailed information about our lab test report, something like that info, I can okay. definitely send it to you. Okay. Yes. Okay. And is, is the same stuff that's in the injectable the same thing that's in the oral? It's the same active? So injection, so we, capsules will be our main product to the U.S. Sure. And the injections, since they are not that legal in the U.S., we will uh, reduce it and uh, get out of the market. But it's the same. I, my question was, was the, the same ingredient in the injectable now just in an oral form? Yes, product? yes. Yeah. But due to the absorption, there's something different. So, okay. As our lab report tested, uh, capsules are a little better than the injection because of the absorption, there's like a peak period. So yeah. capsules has like a, one capsule, I mean, one dose for 24 hours. So capsules had the peak period like go up, down, up, down, like during 24 hours. But injections, you inject it and then goes into the blood, I mean, absorb it, then will go less, less, less than uh, maybe another 24 hours. But, uh, so is the oral, is better, yes. it, the oral is a sustained release? It's what? It's time released, yes. but it's not multiple. Pulses. Is it given several times a day? One. Just one time a day. One time a day, yes. <laughs> thank you. So, no, I mean, first of all, thank you, and I'm glad you're here. And uh, 
here everyone is welcome to speak to make that absolutely clear to you uh, so but also here there is a way which we share information and yes some information isn't until things are out there I get that but is there a website or because not only do the panelists want to know I suspect everyone in the room wants to know so is there a website that you've created oh here I get the card so it's www. So it's www.mutian.us. And there's a Facebook group on the back, FIP treatment using Mutian. Did I say that right? Mutian, okay. But my, my question is still, will the information about the product itself be absolutely transparently, if you understand my English, available? that's a question will it be available and is it available now for people and i think that's in part anyway what what you guys are asking about everything about everything yes how many times a day do we take it but also the ingredients involved in it so they know what they're taking exactly that is available microphone microphone if if your application goes exactly as planned with the fda how long do you think it's going to take to have a legal u.s product in the hands of owners veterinarians what's your timetable okay before the end of the year this year yes <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we are really working hard with this legal stuff because it's really difficult in the U.S. And uh, we are trying to make it legal. And uh, so we're just trying to help as more cat as we can. So, and we want people to trust us. That's why we do a lot of sponsoring in these hospitals to let other vets see we are working. Oh, another thing I want to mention. Uh, Mutian has 12 weeks, which is 84 days guarantee. If like a regular FIP cat, dry or wet form, cannot be cured with Mutian in 84 days, we provide free medicine until it's been cured. We have that confidence to cure that cat. Yes. Okay, and so before I give this to Deb, uh, just one more, uh, yeah. Uh, just kind of one more question. Uh, if this is made legal, you've already applied for Chinese patents and all of that stuff. And obviously you're gonna be able to move this through the Chinese apparatus a lot faster than we can move things through our apparatus. Uh, if, it's, if it's not approved over here, but it's approved over there, what is our ability to use your product based on your approval maybe you could answer that too but do you understand what i mean so you mean if it's a chinese approval it's going to work in the u.s how does that affect its use over here i think it's not going to work <laughs> it's different country because fda is only for the u.s okay so i have a question and kind of with peter and myself having put ourselves out there during the, these trials when our cats, you know, our, our blogs, our websites and things like that, we received a lot of emails and messages from people that have FIP diagnosed cats asking, what can we do? How can my cat be cured like Smokey, like Luna, things like that. So can I, do I send them to your website? Like how do they, how, okay. do, how does the consumer, yes. how does the client get the drug? So uh, two the ways. Draft. <laughs> One way you can go to our website, we have online chat with our specialist. So they will help diagnostic your cat first to see what kind of dosage and the, what's the current situation the cat is. Another way is you can send to our group and the admins will connect to these people to us. So when you say that they can upload their lab results and their yeah, they upload, and things like they that? upload their lab results to us and we take a look and okay. uh, we check these factors or AG ratios 
to see if it's really FIP cases. Good. Okay. We have, have seen question. some non FIP cases. They sought their FIP. So, yes, okay. we have so to you can make help sure it's that yes. and not just sell to the, the client. Okay. Definitely. Yes. I, I have a question in that regard. We just went through a whole morning of diagnosing FIP. How comfortable are the veterinarians in the room of diagnosing FIP with never having their hands on the cat? Glenn? Microphone, microphone, microphone. Um, I, I personally am not because I want to have um, the history, um, the physical exam that tells me a lot. That's just, you know, there's a lot of things to consider when I make a diagnosis. And, and that's not included if you only look at the blood work. We don't make the diagnosis by vet. What vet? We're not a vet. Who's the client? The customer. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. You need you need the microphone. Well, what we do do is we look at the beginning uh, blood work and everything, so we have that on file, so we can monitor the treatment going forward to see if it works. Um, also, to determine at the end of twelve weeks if they're okay to graduate, because we might they need might longer treatment. Um, if they relapse, if they relapse after the twelve week treatment. I mean, we have that guarantee. So we want to be able to monitor everything as well. So when uh, Muti and Spain uh, have their chat, that cat actually has been to a vet. The vet exactly. has made a diagnosis and then they're providing you that information Correct. that has uh, a whole veterinary record with it. Not just, here's my cat's blood work. What do you think? No, okay. no. Right. And there, there's a lot of other things, other infections that might come into play because of the lower immune system. So the vet is always there to confirm other things and maybe other uh, antibiotics or anything like that as well. Okay. So yeah, we're definitely not vets um, that talk to the people. We're just there to help them guide right. the way. So now you three seem like a group. <laughs> I was just going to say that. <laughs> Who are you three right there? Yeah. So, admins of that group. Okay. Admins. We're admins of the group. Admins of the Facebook group formation. For me, Tina. Okay. Yeah. And you all three have cats that have, have so, been yes. cured or in the process of being cured. Her and I both had neuro cats. Okay. She had so, I have one other question. You were talking about the support that you offer. Um, the diagnostics is that an additional cost to the consumer no. no so that's all part of the the, we've, the treatment we've all been there like i've been there crying my cat's gonna die so we're there for those moms like i met kelly because she called me right, and her right. cat was on death's door right. and i actually connected her and it followed her story supported right. her the entire way like just been a support group we've right, all right. been there we all want to support each other absolutely i totally 100 totally agree right. yeah. so so if um say tomorrow i have one of my other cats was diagnosed i come to you, I upload my labs, and you review these labs, and we decide to start a, a treatment plan. Um, so the cost that, you know, you would pay to you, that includes all of that support throughout, not to addressing the of course. Yeah, is that all um, part of the yeah, plan? Just the treatment, nothing for the diagnostic. So currently, uh, we have a hard time for the diagnostic because when customer come to us, if to diagnostic this FIP, we have experts who has very experience with these cases, okay. and we usually send our reports to China to see it. So right now on our website, we are trying to hire like uh, two professional FIP vets yes. to help diagnostic cats in the future yes. so what's the turnaround time from the time that someone contacts you to the time that so everything's I'm, looked at and i'm trying to get these professional vets in fip already so just trying to figure out and organize everything so, yes so, for we, full disclosure which we always have to do for you three there are any of you paid by mutually or receive any compensation so their answer was no. So in case you didn't hear, oh yeah, you. I guess you can grab that. You, you, you. That's okay. 
I want the steps. So Go ahead. Um, I'm looking on your website right now. It looks very professional. Are you the FIP community group? It, it says at the bottom email, put in an email. Is that how we reach your group? It, it says at the bottom, we can enter our email to join the Mushin FIP community now. Always. You can always do the online chat. So there's always people reply you and they give you our contact info. Okay. Do we get there off of your website? Yes. Okay, yes. thank you. All right, bunch of questions over here and I will get there. Yes. Oh, okay. So thank you, Julie. Everyone's saving me steps. I don't know if that's, so the cost. Okay, the cost is, before you answer that, because I, I've done research, so I know what you're going to say, uh, or approximately. Uh, so understanding in veterinary medicine in our country all the time, there are people that cannot afford, for example, chemotherapy, that kind of thing. Having said that, what do you do about the people that can't afford the cost you're about to articulate? Okay, for people who cannot afford. Tell us what the cost is. Okay, so the cost, it's not that cheap. Um, for example, like a three kg FIP cat with wet or dry usually costs about $4,000 for the whole treatment. So, but it, it's based on the weight. The heavier the cat is, more expensive. Yes. And, um, but they don't have to buy the treatment a full treatment in one time so they can buy weekly or 10 days we do the adjustments for these people uh, so for these people who cannot afford i'm not going to say say here because <laughs> there's a lot of customer here i might offer some help but i don't want everyone to know right <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so we are a drug company, but we are trying to help. So as we have spent a ton of money on the research, that's why the drug is expensive. But in the future, um, everything goes well. We will have a Mutian Center in the US to sponsor these cats who cannot afford or help these people whose cat has FIP. Probably, I'm thinking about California. Yes. But what about what about what about the cost of the nutritional supplement that you say will be available? Well, that's the cost of that too, and it'll be available over the counter. You suggest? That's a lot to go to Walgreens and pay. <laughs> okay. Okay, Dr. So, Peterson. Yeah, there's there's uh, several questions. If I get this if I get this correct. A veterinarian in the United States may have no involvement with this treatment. Uh, so basically it is possible for an owner to uh, see that their cat has what they think is FIP, which people are fairly, this group is fairly adept, but realize these rescue people and shelter people or the cattery people, they know this disease far better than an owner that goes and adopts a cat somewhere and is, ends up eight weeks later with a case of FIP, you know? So, so, so let me get this correct. The, the, the people that know about FIP, the cattery people, the, uh, the shelter people, the rescue people, they're going to say, I got a cat here that has FIP. Okay. So I'm going to contact somebody on this website. And I'm going to present them with some information and that person on that website who may be a veterinarian, maybe a Chinese veterinarian, maybe a, a, a U.S. veterinarian or a Spanish veterinarian or whatever. Okay, they're going to look at whatever information you have and they're going to say, yeah, I think it is FIP. That's an okay for you then to sell this person this, this drug. Okay, is that is that am I am I correct with that 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 a, a, a number of people can never see a, a, a veterinarian per se over here uh, and have their treat the cat treated, which is kind of like 
just having a headache and going to the drugstore and getting some uh, uh, aspirin or whatever, NSAIDs. So for these over counters, it's not like you said Walgreens stuff like that. It's going through our website or some clinics, not like Walgreens. So yeah, it's, it's really not any different though. But uh, we always have to make sure if it's FIP. But I understand people usually they don't ask you just to buy it directly. But if it's at five P's, they will see the improvement probably in ten days. Yes, but people always ask before they buy. So the the person that that happens to have bought a purebred kitten five months ago or adopted a cat from a shelter or that, they're likely to get their diagnosis when their cat is sick and they're taken to their veterinarian. Is that what we're saying? And then that veterinarian is. Then, then that veterinarian could have a access to your advice and, and, and treat. Yes, yes. Okay, so then the second question I have is what happens to all these competitors that are coming in, the, in flooding into the market that are lowering the price progressively? You know, the price has gone down dramatically and then there's even a new one online, by the way, which you probably know about unknown that's even lower than everything else so you know you you Chinese are very entrepreneurial people uh, and uh, we appreciate that it's it's said that you're second only to us uh, in capitalism but anyway so uh, but we are transparent and so or at least we try to be okay maybe so, too transparent so um, I'm not going to say anything bad about them. The difference between Wu Tian and the other brand is we are the only GMP standard manufacturer in China to produce this kind of product. Uh, they are currently still illegal in China and uh, we are not comparing price with them because we are different and uh, they only have the injection form. They are, they cannot go even go through the U.S. custom. Yes. Um, but will the China remind us what GMP is, please. Okay, so GMP is kind of like a, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jack Stein, yeah. Good manufacturing practices. So that's some sort of guarantee that the product's going to be well produced in good facilities and uh, yes. be, be kind of the same and consistent. Uh, let me just ask you one last question. These other competitors that are coming on the market in China that are undercutting the price, okay, does the Chinese government have any way, if you get a patent on your product in China, okay, let's forget about the United States, but in China, do you, can you stop these people in China? I don't think Can the so. Chinese government stop these people? Okay, so um, these products are illegal, but you can not, never stop this illegal stuff, same as US. It's like the, it's like the grass, you burn it, it grows again. <laughs> All right, I think we have a uh, <laughs> nice. I, I think we have a question. Uh, do, Julie, do we have a couple more than a couple, but we could take just one perhaps because of time? How about? Continuation of palliative care and other ways of, you know, supporting the cat after diagnosis and with treating with mission. Palliative care during treatment in general, Dr. Glenn, do you Give the microphone? Time. Not quite sure I understand it, but if I, I think I do, is you know, the, 
I treat it like any other cat. If it's dehydrated, then I rehydrate it. If it's uh, nauseated, then I'll give it a, a you know anti nausea medicine. If it has an infection, yeah. If, if it's uh, poor nutrition, then I talk to my clients and make sure that they understand a cat's got to eat. <laughs> you know, and I can turn blue in the face on what I think a cat should be eating to stay healthy. But if it's not eating anything, well, it's appetite stimulant, uh, high nutritional plane. Yeah, I mean, no or different than any other cat. Yeah. Those sorts of things. Just, just to add from, you know, from an owner's perspective, um, we, there, there are things out there, as I said before, that can help cats live longer and better with FIP if they're not being treated by GS. You know, there, there are things that are helping cats live with FIP as a chronic disease, which are not not the GS. There are things that can be done. Knowledge is power. You need to have a source, like a good social media group that's not just involved with treatment, but that has information that's available that you can access and you can talk to your vet about it. I mean, we always, always say that a vet must be involved. You know, you, you, you can't make a scientific experiment of your own cat. I mean, it's very important, but there's so much we've learned over the years that can help cats. And the best thing is get that diagnosis as soon as you can. Start something, be it doxy and pred, you know, be it PI, start something as soon as possible to give that chance you know, that cat the best chance to live longer. And it, it may work, it might not, but you know, it's something that we have now. And we also know how to treat cats. We know that Pred isn't the only thing. We know that cats, you know, draining cats can be beneficial. You know, have the right vet, have a good vet, <laughs> talk to the vet. And um, there's information out there that's good information. So, so this woman said her hand raised several times, I know. Uh, one other question that this person followed up on, that they're confused about Dr. Ola, uh, and also based on what Susan just said, and some people have been saying over the past day, yes about PRED, prednisolone, no about prednisolone during treatment. So there's confusion, uh, and maybe there are varying opinions about that is the issue. So Dr. Ola, I want your comment about prednisolone, yes or no? But we need the microphone for you to do it. Um, I think uh, Dr. Peterson uh, gave an explanation yesterday regarding the immune sy system's functionality and get to a point where you want a functioning immune, immune system, a healthy immune system. So like the patients I have, um, I'm, I'm, I'm cautious. I, right or wrong, this is all new territory. I start tapering the PRED slowly during the course. And okay, that's what I've been doing, right or wrong. Okay, uh, this is the last. It's with the GS. Yes, with the GS. I I I don't know if it's going to work. The cat's on pred, and once I see I got a working uh, something working, I start tapering off of that pred, but I go slowly. That's just what I do. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but my, my, this cat's thriving, so I'm doing. We're doing something right. Okay, uh, last question. I promise I'll be fast, but I feel like it's an important point to bring up. Um, we've brought up a couple of times that it's great that we're all in the same room, um, but just just kind of culminate what people are kind of mentioning. The onus is on us as individuals to support each other when we speak to a client. So I work for a rescue. Um, I encourage them when they reach out to us for help. I say, talk to your vet. Make sure you remember that your vet is human. And that means they cannot keep all the things in their brain all the time. So be gentle with them like you need them to be gentle with you. So we try to say that and give people that kind of preparation so that if they don't interact with their vet well, that they have the opportunity to go speak to another vet, but to be, again, as kind as possible. We're all so emotionally charged about this topic. We've all ha had great loss and pain associated. So veterinarians reaching, you know, they are incredible people that give so much of themselves and can get burnt to the point of where they can't hear anymore. So as clients remembering that and trying to help our clients who come to us for help, reminding them that they can educate their vet, they can work with their vet. And so I think all of us breeders, rescue groups, et cetera, the onus is on us to say, yes, you are in pain. 
let's figure out how to do it together. Okay, well I think we've had a, a very encouraging morning, a very informative morning. Um, we still have uh, a couple more sessions to go, and so let's uh, hold on to, we'll work those questions in. Since this is the first break of the morning, um, should we come back a little bit later and so take a little Well, that could be other session, so maybe just a 20-minute break. Is that okay? Because we don't, we don't want to delay lunch, because if that happens, I am in big trouble.